Hi, I'm Linda Fenaris, host of B2B Brand 180 podcast and CEO of Millennium Agency, where we talk all about branding and growth strategies for your business. But before I start today, I just wanted to thank our listeners for listening in. And if you like what you hear, please feel free to like, share, or subscribe to just help our channel grow. So today I'm excited to bring in Doug Brown. He is from CEO Sales Strategies. It's specifically designed for individuals who sell from a business to a business. So it's B2B focused and it's really around different ways to help our audience grow their company. So a little bit of background about Doug. He's led a lot of client award-winning and high-performance teams and profitable development programs for companies. He's worked with Intuit, CBS, Procter & Gamble, and many others to name a few. And today, Doug owns an advisory and training company, and he helps businesses and individuals actually increase their sales revenue and profitability to line up with those top 1% of performing salespeople. So welcome, Doug, to the B2B Brand 180 podcast, and thank you for joining me today. Linda, thanks for having me here, and thanks for making me sound somewhat important. I appreciate it. <laughs> you absolutely do. So I would love for you to take a couple of minutes and share a little bit of information about yourself that maybe I haven't covered yet. Well, I started working at the age of three for my dad's business. And, That's great. Uh, yeah, yeah. I swept floors for 25 cents a week. It was one of the greatest jobs. I had a lots of candy at the end of the, at the end of the week, because back then you could buy candy for, you know, a penny for a handful. Good. Um, yep. And, uh, and I've built about 35 companies over my life since that period of time with partnerships or, or owning them outright myself. Some were very, very successful. Some were not. And, you know, some broke even and that's called entrepreneurship. And I think many listeners might be able to relate to that. And, you know, I spent 12 years in the military. I built businesses on the side through the military and, you know, eventually decided Geez, I needed an education, so I went and got a couple of college degrees and kind of followed that path. But, you know, I've learned a lot of things through the years, some to do and some not to do. I think, you know, probably my, my crowning achievements in life are my, are my children above and beyond anything else to me. So, you know, I have a pretty good value set on family and many businesses, I've built them around the family. So I always figure you build your life first now and then you build your business around that. Right. No, that's a great point. And that's an important part. So that's awesome to hear. So I'd love to ask you this question because this has always been a challenge since the day I started my first marketing job is that sales and marketing people don't often align when it comes to what they do. You know, you've got marketing that are driving the leads and sales saying all the leads are no good. So I am wondering, what do you have for strategies and ideas to help our audience actually get those two areas of business aligned a little bit better than they typically are? Yeah, yeah. That's the old with the water and vinegar type of solution, right? A lot of times in companies and it's, and it's unfortunate because the company actually suffers when that happens. And so I think the, the thing that I've used to get people on board is to understand and agree on what is actually a qualified lead in selling and what is qualified lead in marketing. And for people to understand, because when I talk to salespeople, they don't, they don't understand what marketers do a lot of times. So they think, you know, marketers are in this room and they're just doing their job and they just throw these leads out there and they don't put the effort in that salespeople think they're supposed to put in. And then you talk to marketers and they're like, well, you know, these leads are qualified and salespeople are like, no, they're not, you know? And and so you have that game going back and forth. And what I do is I take a, a, a bell curve and I draw it out for them and I say, okay, look, in the middle of all bell curves, you got about 68% of your audience that's going to be in the middle of a bell curve. Those are going to be your potentials. Now, half the bell curve leans toward the pretender side and half the bell curve leads, leans toward the sales ready side. Mm-hmm. All right. So let's define what the potentials are, but let's not even focus there. Let's look at the left side of the bell curve. On the left side of the bell curve, you're going to have more pretenders and you're going to have people who are indifferent. Mm -hmm. When salespeople get leads like that, they're going to be angry because to them, it's a waste of their time. But marketing might have that as a marketing qualified lead. Now, if we look at the right side of the bell curve, we're going to have people who are more committed. You know, I call them Kaizen players because they're kind of Mm -hmm. into the game. And then to the real extreme right, 
you got the, the sales, the purchase order ready lead, right? Which is what right. every salesperson in the world wants. So what we do is we map that out and we define what is supposed to be from that potential line up. That is really more of a sales qualified lead. And what is, you know, marketing qualified leads mean? And when should sales take that lead? Once I can get those two to agree to that point, then usually the friction seems to melt away. So it's a communications issue more so than anything else and, and ego driven things that get right. in. Right. And that, that's usually the challenge. And that's how I've been able to resolve it in many, many companies. So you define and categorize the level or the quality of that lead within the, the company. And then from there, you're able to determine back in the, the old days, they used to call them like cold leads, warm leads, hot leads. Now right. there are a multitude of different levels around that as well. Well, yeah, the, the <laughs> thing is this, we can define it, but we have to get agreement on it. And just like any agreement, you get a sign off on it. So you put together a sheet and you say, this is what we agreed to. And, you know, the head of sales is signing it, the head of marketing signing it, the, the owner of the company or the CEO, we all sign it. We all go, here's how we're playing. And that usually defines how we play. So therefore the rules aren't blurred anymore. The challenge is, and salespeople don't send hate mail in to me, please. But the challenge is you don't understand what marketing does, right? And the challenge for marketing is they think that they understand what sales does because, you know, sometimes marketers were salespeople. And so the challenge is really that it's a communications issue within a company and, and it's not set or defined by leadership and agreed upon by the parties who are leading. And that's where I find the friction coming from. Yeah. And that makes complete sense because that foundation, which is defining the quality of that lead and having a definition for each one of those categories can clear up a lot, right? If you, you make a, you're talking to somebody and they're just not interested or they're, they might look at it next year, that can be in a specific category. And to your point, if somebody's ready to sign a purchase order, that goes into another category. So if you can break that down and build out your whatever, you know, I'm not exactly sure what you call them, but if they're just ca I'll call them categories for this point and figure out what goes into each one, I think it will definitely help the sales process and the marketers understand like what's working and what's not working, frankly. Right. Because, because Linda, most people don't understand even conversion rate versus close rate, right? They, they right. blend them together. And, you know, one being the conversion rate from the time, say, so let's just keep it defined easy for people from the time the lead hits to the time it lead closes, right? So we can measure that and determine whether marketing is, is as effective or not. And then from the time the salesperson actually talks to the person to the time that closes, well, that's a close right. rate, right? So when we look at that side, we can, we can then deem, okay, is this a sales challenge, a marketing challenge, both mm -hmm. challenges, mm -hmm. right? And what I have found working with literally thousands of companies, it's never one challenge. It's, it's, always, right. it's always a multitude of things. And that's why we get people to agree on what the definitions and the rules are, just like right. in a sporting game. Otherwise, you know, you're going to be shooting the puck in the wrong side of the net, you know, and, and going, oh, I scored. No, you didn't. You scored against us, right? That type exactly. of Exactly. So when you're working with a sales people, for example, what are, what are sort of the number one reason, what is like the number one reason why they aren't closing or why they're having difficulty closing? Well, that's a big question, but I would say that the answer to that <laughs> <laughs> Firstly, they don't know what a real buyer is most of the time. They haven't defined it. And so they're spending a lot of their time, you know, the, the old term happy years, right? Oh, I got something mm -hmm. in it and it's going to close. So they're they right. chasing it down, but they're not qualifying it to make sure it's really a true buyer. That's where a lot of salespeople spend a tremendous amount of time just hoping and trying to get it over the line. And the biggest challenge that they have is they don't generate enough self leads anyways. So right. they're, they're reaching most of the time because they don't have, you know, let's say that they know their ratio, they needed 40 leads a month to double. Mm -hmm. Well, they have 20 leads a month and they're barely making quota. So what they're doing is they're, they're not generating enough leads on their own or they're relying on marketing to actually do the lead right. generation. Right. So that's where they get in trouble because the master prospector will always, 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 always outsell the master closer. 
Mm-hmm. That's been that amazing. makes sense. And the second thing they're doing, which they're making a mistake now, and, and quite frankly, it's not as much of their fault, but they haven't realized that sales has shifted. Mm-hmm. Right. So the internet flattened sales. Right. I remember back in the n- late 90s, I was telling people this was going to happen and they told me, you're crazy. <laughs> and I'm like, no, no, think about it. They, they got the information now that they used to rely on us. And they were like, no, no, it never happened. Well, guess what? We're here. And then the pandemic really flattened it. Mm-hmm. And now AI is doing the same thing. And so what's happening is the power has shifted. The information has shifted to the buyer's side of the table right and so today more than anything we've got to be more personalized and more meaningful and more relevant in our conversations and there's so many people coming in oh i'll do a discovery session you should have that discovery session done before you actually get in the building right and and that's where they're making the challenge happen for themselves because they're not able to competitively differentiate themselves from from all the other people doing the same thing so they should know a lot of information before they get to the actual meeting today. More so, you know, in years of past, course. that's where you discovered it. And they have the ability to do that based on what's available oh today. Gosh, anyway, I mean, it's it. so easy. Yeah. You know, and yeah, the, uh, the, one, the one point that you did mention earlier is the salesperson may not qualify during the process. So let's say they have somebody that they're saying, hey, I got this you know, company that's interested. I'm going to close them next month. I know. But in all sincerity, they haven't really done the qualification process to ensure that they're going to close. Are, should they be asking specific questions along that process? What should they be doing to make sure that they are leading that prospect down a path to close eventually versus just sit back and wait. Yeah. There's some major strokes of the brush that they could, they should always have a, what, what do they want? Right. Mm -hmm. Do they actually want something? Because a lot of people hear things when they're selling and they go, Oh yeah. It's, it's like, I I relate this sometimes to a, a man and a woman sitting, talking, and the woman's beautiful and the guy's very interested and she says something and he takes it as a cue like, oh, she's interested. Well, right. maybe not, right? So they're not qualifying that people buy for generally two reasons. A, they want to resolve some challenge that's going on now so uh-huh. they know they have a problem. Or B, they're looking for a better future, some type of opportunity. Right. And we as the seller, we must know what that is. And right. most of the people that I've listened to their calls or sat in on their, you know, their meetings, they don't qualify that. So A, what do they want? B, what do they want? What time frame do they want it in? Mm-hmm. Okay. So that's the other thing that, you know, it's like they're hearing it and they're like, oh yeah, yeah. They, they give me indication, but they not qualifying what time frame they want that particular thing. The third thing would be, are, are they committed really right. when it comes down to it? So is this just a conversation that they're they're trying to figure out what to do and how to do? And, you know, now we as a sales channel go, oh my gosh, I heard all these happy things. So mm-hmm. I'm going to make my commit, you know, to this and I'm going to announce my numbers. And it's really two, three, four months out, maybe, you know, number four, have they talked to all the stakeholders? Right. Because this is a big one that people miss all the time. There are more and more people in the decision-making process now than there were 10 years ago for the average sale. And so if we negate or don't pay attention to the influencers or the multiple stakeholders that are in that position, then, and if we've never asked the question to qualify that, right. Right. Then, then, then we miss out. And the, the last one is there's two last ones. One, do they want to commit within a time frame that we can actually achieve? Mm-hmm. And, and, and the, not a lot of times they can. And, right. the, and, and the last one is, do they have budget for it? Mm-hmm. I mean, Linda, I, I was shocked how many people do not ask about budget, right? They're like, oh, we got this sale going on, sale going on. And then it's like, okay, let's try to close this thing. And it's like, well, we don't have funds right. appropriated for this, you know? Or, geez, we can't do this until our, our next year's, you know, allocation comes in or whatever. 
But in the meantime, they've gone to their boss's boss and said, hey, I commit this number this month. And that's where the challenge runs into. So they, they really should have a checklist of what's most important for them. And every mm -hmm. single time they go through this, they just go through that basic checklist. And, you know, you had mentioned 1% earners. They do this every single time. It is, you know, boring to acknowledge. You're right. If you think about it from a sales perspective, I've been on both sides of the coin. But if you don't, if you start brainstorming with a prospective customer and you start uncovering maybe some interest. So let's say they're interested in, you know, I don't know, email marketing because you brought it up. It's a thought. It doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to buy those services. It just means that you've uncovered something that you, you just piqued their interest. So if you don't ask those additional questions that you just mentioned, you know, are you the, who's the decision maker? What's the time frame? So on and so forth. That could just be sort of pie in the sky ideas that will never come to fruition. So I think those are really great points that you made is kind of coming up with those questions to ask, regardless of who you're on the call with, to make sure it's like what I'll call real. And, and, the, and the reality is the buyer appreciates it anyways, because they want to discuss all the issues on the table and see if they can get help. Right. Right. Otherwise they wouldn't be talking to us. Exactly. Yeah. Are there other strategies that people, salespeople can use to just simply close more sales? I mean, I think everything you just mentioned makes complete sense, but are there other tactics that you could share with the audience today? Yeah, I, I, I'm going to keep coming back to this point because too many people miss this. So it should be more of an active communication path versus a passive communication path. And this is where people, they won't ask questions that make people think. Mm -hmm. And if you want to differentiate yourself, anyone wants to differentiate themselves now today, they, they've got to ask questions that make the eyebrows go up. Right. And without doing that due diligence, that research ahead of time, it's very difficult to, to understand what kind of questions to ask. And we, and, and we want active, constructive conversation going on, which means that when somebody is talking to us and they say something like, you know, I just got a job promotion, right? Let's say that's just mm -hmm. something that came up. Active constructive would be like, geez, you know, Jay, that is amazing. You know what? You've been working here for 11 years. You, you, you seem to be the hardest worker. You won president's award three years in a row. You really deserve that. That would be like active, constructive communication. Right. But a lot of times people are using active passive or even active okay. destructive communication. Active passive would be like something like, well, that's good for you, Jay. Congratulations. Now you can hear the difference in the communication Absolutely. going on, right? Right there. And like, you know, passive destructive would be like, oh yeah, Jay, you know, we we had we had to hire an Italian, you know. I mean yeah, like, yeah, right. Oh, yeah. Right, that yeah. type of thing. And so what I hear a lot of times in sales conversations is not a lot of active constructive. And this is what has us leaning in to communicate as human beings. So it's kind of a technique that we teach as well is how do you really communicate and connect with that person? Because I mean, you know, they got, sometimes they have, they're working from home. They got the kids mm -hmm. running around. They've got a dog in the background bark. You know, there's all kinds of things. It's true. Happen. So I just want to share with our audience. So if you like what you're hearing today from Doug, please take a moment to like, share, or subscribe, or provide a review online to the B2B Brand 180 podcast. So I have a few more questions for you, and I'd love you to answer this one specifically. What are two factors, I guess, for most people that result them in losing maybe 10% of sales? Because 10% of sales is a big number. So yeah. what are some key factors that you can share with our audience so maybe they can not lose that 10 percent. there's one huge one and it's called follow-up and lack of is is one of the number one reasons that people do not get the sale and it's crazy because people think in the moment for today and they're not playing long term right and you know, I know myself, it's taken me sometimes two years to close larger sales. Yeah. I, I had a friend of mine, it took him 17 years to close a sale. He made $6.8 million in commission, 
So I think it was worth <laughs> it. Was worth it. Yeah, <laughs> I would say so. But I think it will illustrate it this way. I was actually uh, invited to a sales conference uh, where they were actually training sales consultants. And it was a uh, consortium of people who sold the same service. And mm -hmm. so one lady comes in and she says to the audience, they say, well, you look a little down, you know, what's, what's going on. And she said, well, I just lost the sale. Okay. And I want to tell all of you, don't do this. So, you know, eight months ago, I talked to this company. They said they were kind of in the decision-making process and I sort of let the drop the ball and I didn't really pay. And they said about six months from now, they were going to start making the decision. And I just got so busy. I just forgot to get back to them. And then all of a sudden I was like, oh my gosh, I didn't get back to them. And I called them and they said, you know, uh, thanks for calling, but we bought last week actually. And we bought and they gave the, the other representative's name. And oh and she said, I got to tell you this, because I didn't follow up, they signed a five-year deal. My commission on that five-year deal was $500,000 a year. Wow. It was a recurring contract for a half million dollars in commission every mm -hmm. year. So she lost two and a half million dollars for not following up. The challenge is that people don't have a system for it. Mm -hmm. And so, Linda... I will give advice to anybody on this line to do this. Take three contacts you have today in your database that you haven't talked to or that you just sold or whatever, and just text them, three of them. Hi, Linda, right. it's Doug. I'm just following up to see how your day's going. Something simple, right? Three a day, every single day. So if we did that for 300 days a year, that's 900 contacts. Out right. of 900 contacts, some of them are, are what we call dormant buyers. Mm -hmm. Some of them are delayed buyers. Mm -hmm. But the challenge is that people don't do this. If they do this, we've measured this, you will we'll get between 5 and 10% of sales a year to re-engage and close. So it's follow-up. And I, I promote a multi-modality thing to do. No, you don't have right. to do just the text. You could, that's easy, though. You, know, you can make right. phone calls. You could send letters. You could send a card. My God, who uses direct mail today? If you want to stand out, send mm -hmm. a card. You know, yeah, it costs you two dollars, but mm -hmm. you know what? You're making a thousand dollars a sale. <laughs> ROI is high. So follow up is the number one way to clean up all of these sales because even when I look at studies, Marketo I think did one showed that 62 percent of incoming leads will close over time but they only close at like 2.7% per month over time. Okay. Okay. Interesting. But, but the problem is people don't stay in touch with one another. We all know the statistics, 50% yeah. of people never follow up once, you know? Exactly. And that's, that's where they're dropping the ball. And I learned this from Jay Conrad Red Levinson, who wrote a book called Guerrilla Marketing. Yes. I remember that. <laughs> so I was talking to Jay one day about that. And he said, you know, 86% of sales are lost due to lack of follow. -up. And I went, that's a huge number. So I didn't believe it. So I started looking at it and that's where I was like, you know, I don't believe it's 86%, but I believe right. it's a high, high number. Right. Um, and the second thing that they can do, as I mentioned earlier, is be personalized now. Mm -hmm. uh, because mm -hmm. that today is so much more important than it ever was. Yeah, that makes sense. That's great, Doug. I think what I do like what you were talking about on following up is that the buying cycle is such a timing issue that I think salespeople who have that hunter personality and they're always searching for the next best, you know, you know, adrenaline rush, forget that if they can continue that process of following up on even past prospects who have contacted them can really yield some results. So it is a timing thing. They may not be ready today, but they may be ready six months from now. And if you're there, it only helps you close that sale. Well, and, and, and salespeople are working harder than they need to, right, Linda? Because mm -hmm. if they just clearly define their buyer, if they use personalized and meaningful communication and they continuously stayed in touch with that person, they're going to pick up sales anyways, just as you said, because the buying right. cycle my, you know, and, and what they're missing out is on future opportunities, even more so than the past opportunities, because new things come up. And the, the crazy part is 
what they're doing when they don't follow up is they're educating their buyer and they're priming their buyer to buy from their competition because then when the competition right. follows up, they're already primed. Yep, exactly. So I understand that you've written a book. I've written two of them. So yes. I would love, okay, I would love for you to share a little bit about the two books and where they can, where our audience can find them. So one, I wrote one called Win-Win Selling, How to Unlock the Power of Profitability by Resolving Objections. That was the first book I wrote. Mm -hmm. And I wrote it specifically on objections because many people had questions about objections. And so I, I went into the psychology and the philosophy of where does an objection actually come from? It comes from our childhood, believe it or not. We learn them from childhood up from our a lot of times from the people that we love the most, they're, they have certain behaviors and we emulate them as we go and get older and we bring them into business. And so you could get that one on Amazon. And then I wrote just recently a book about 1% earners, nonstop 1% earner. And uh, that's in an ebook format right now. And so if people would like that, may I give the address? Is that Absolutely. okay? That's www, well, CEO sales strategies mm -hmm. com forward slash one PE, one PE, the number okay. one PE okay. percent earner. And people okay. can get that one for free if they'd like, or if they want a copy of win-win selling, we have it on ebook too. I can give that away. Just send an email to you matter, Y-O-U-M-A-T-T-E-R at ceosalesstrategies.com and I'll get you out a book. Um, oh, that's fantastic. You Thank best. you for our audience. would love that. No, that's great. Well, Doug, they, I want to take a minute and thank our audience for tuning into the B2B Brand 180 podcast today. And we hope that you found the insights and information valuable to your business. And thanks again, Doug. I would love, that was fantastic. I, I actually got a lot of great tips myself. So this is great. And can you share with the audience how they can get in touch with you directly and maybe yeah. your website? Great. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so my LinkedIn is Doug Brown, one, two, three, if they want to go there. So just D O U G B R O W N one, two, three. The website is CEO sales com. They can send an email into you matter. It, it will get to the whole company and then they'll get it to me. Or if they want to email me directly, it's Doug at. CEO sales strategies.com. But those are the best ways to get a hold of me. And, you know, if they have any questions or comments, we welcome all of them and we answer everything that comes in. So if you don't hear from us, just let us know because we're, we're really, I would say, diligent about getting back to people because it's a common courtesy, number one. All right. Right. No, that's great. Go ahead. I, I was going to say, can I, can I just say something about your podcast? Because, sure. Uh, I have been, you know, doing podcasts for years like this and I review them before I, so folks, I do my research too. Right. So, and so I went up today and gave your podcast a five-star review because I listened to some episodes. Your podcast is amazing. This podcast has some of the best content on it I've ever heard. You know, I listened to the, the Corey, I think it was Corey Schneider. Harry Sprague, yeah. you know, a couple of people on there, the, your interview style in this particular podcast to me is tops of the top. And so I, I just wanted to let you know, I appreciate you having me on here and folks, please go review this podcast because it needs to get out to more people and the more reviews you have, the higher the, the, the ratings, the higher the ratings, the more that Linda will actually get featured. And I'm not saying that because you and I have never met each other up to this call. So <laughs> that's true. Right. So I'm saying this because I truly, truly mean what I'm saying. So thank you, Linda. Yeah. Thank you so much for that compliment. It's great to have. It's great to hear that, honestly. So excellent. So again, I am Linda Fenaris, host of the B2B Brand 180 podcast and CEO of Millennium Agency. And you can visit us at mill, M-I-L-L dot agency or lindafenaris.com. Or simply you can connect with me directly on LinkedIn. And thanks again for listening to the B2B Brand 180 podcast. <laughs>